Good afternoon and welcome to the BBA's webinar on FRTB and the Great Transformation, delivered in partnership with Associate Members MISIS. Today, to discuss matters, I'm delighted to be joined by this, uh, in this hour by Simon Hills, BBA Executive Director of Potential Capital, Risk and Regulatory Relationships, Peter Farley, Senior Strategist, Capital Markets MISIS, and Thomas Ema, Senior Manager in Barringer Partners Risk and Compliance Practice. Just before I hand over to Simon, I'd like to invite you to participate in this webinar in two ways. The first, by asking questions. If you have a question for the presenters, you can ask a question at any time simply by clicking on the Ask a Question button on your screen, which is located underneath the presentation. Please note that when you ask a question, your name of your organization is not disclosed to any other webinar attendees. Secondly, if you would like to um, ask questions um, throughout the presentation, just ensure um, that you can, um, that you make sure that you um, complete your questions, send them in, and we'll answer them as soon as possible. We'd also like to invite you to participate in our Ask the Audience polls. To participate in the polls, a pop-up box with the question will appear on your screen. Simply answer, answer the question in that box and click OK. We intend to present for 40 minutes and then answer your questions for the remaining 20 minutes. Simon, over to you. Thanks very much, Philip. So I think we're now in the end game of final, uh, finalising the prudential re regulatory framework. Very clearly, the Basel Committee has told us by the end of the year. But despite that, there's still a lot to finish off. The standardised approach to credit risk, uh, the removal of uh, advanced modelling for operational risk and its replacement with a standardised approach, and consider about the consideration of the extent to which credit risk modelling should still be allowed. And that's a consultation that's open for, uh, uh, in fact, that's just closed. I put our, uh, our response into that on Friday. And there's one consultation, the leverage ratio consultation, which is open for another, another couple of weeks. In terms of how this is playing out in the European environment, I expect to see draft legislation on some of the stuff that's been finalised over the past year or two from the European Commission, let's call that CRR2, uh, by the end of the, the year. So CRR2 is likely going to cover net stable funding ratio, large exposures, TLAC, Pillar 2, and the fundamental review of the trading book. I don't think we're going to see draft text in relation to standardised modelling for credit and operational risk or, or the leverage ratio or uh, the use of advanced modelling uh, until probably well into uh, 2018, let's call that CRR3. So I suspect that the Commission won't be thinking about the stuff that's still open for discussion and finalisation. There's a quiz going on, of course, in relation to the Basel proposals for, for a while yet. But it is clear to me that CRR2 will include the fundamental review of the trading book. So it's important that we all understand what it's going to mean for our businesses and particularly uh, what we have to do to implement it. So it is important, I think, that uh, we all understand uh, what's going to be asked of us by our, our, our colleagues. I think it's great that uh, colleagues from uh, MISIS are here to help us think about that. Thomas, why is uh, fundamental review of the trading book so important? Um, thank you, Simon. Um, so maybe just to give the context of, um, of the fundamental review of the trading book, obviously this exercise started out uh, several years ago with the financial crisis. We got something which uh, most people call Basel 2.5, um, a sort of an interim fix, but already then there was a notion that, well, we need some sort of more fundamental, as the uh, fundamental review says, uh, review of of the practices which are of the regulation covering market risk. Uh, I think we went through uh, a very large number of QS, a very large number of uh, consultation papers, and uh, in January we got the um, final uh, version now, I think. Um, why is it so important to banks? I think sort of the, there's probably four points uh, banks need to look at, uh, which is the first one is basically the trading book, banking book boundary. So in the past, there was a lot of frustration from the regulatory side, but um, it was very sort of subjective and for the individual bank to make up their mind um, what is trading book, what is not trading book, and uh, also the associated arbitrage opportunities. So the new regulation introduces a fairly um, 
stringent border. I think the key issue here is that you have to determine upfront where you book something, and once it's in there, there's almost no way you can shift it. There are processes to shift them, but they make it so unattractive that there's really no point in doing that. Um, the second point I would want to highlight is the desk definition. So the fundamental review of the trading book introduces the term uh, of a trading desk. Um, I think every bank has already trading desks, but those are typically not regulatory defined. Uh, so in this new regulation, trading desk is a defined term. There's a lot of things you have to do for a trading desk, starting from defining a trading strategy, identifying the instruments, um, and producing a set of reports, um, what that trading desk does, and basically monitor how that trading desk implements its strategy. And then the third point is the yeah the new standardized approach. So that um, depends where you are currently, but basically it's going to be applicable to all banks. So if you are as a bank currently on the IMA approach, you will have to build this. Um, if you're currently on the old standardized approach, then this will be sort of a significant step up in terms of complexity. And I think my fourth point would be the new uh, internal model-based approach, which um, basically introduces a lot of restrictions and provides a lot clearer guidance on how these models need to look like and what you can actually do and restrict some of the modeling practices which were previously applied. So I think there's also a lot of work in basically working out what your current model does versus what's allowed in the future. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll hand it over to Peter to get his point of view on this. Okay, uh, th thanks Thomas. Um, I think from our perspective as a, a technology vendor, we're certainly in discussions with our customers that, um, who, who understand this is probably one of the most complex challenges that they're having to deal with. Um, for four main reasons, I think, that um, the complexity which you've just outlined, which is being foisted upon um, these, these banks, means that they're going to have to have what we're calling sort of front-to-risk cohesiveness, cohesiveness around pricing and uh, the curves data. Um, they're going to have to do this in much more closer to real-time analysis, so they're going to have to much, have much speedier, rapid delivery of data and more sophisticated analytics to process them. And they're going to have much better uh, capacity or, or volume management of the data that they're going to be dealing with. So um, the use of much more sophisticated in-memory computing capabilities. Um, and then the basic bedrocks to manage all of that, which new technologies are making more accessible to banks, um, built around uh, GPU capabilities and so forth. Now, clearly, these are not easy investment decisions for banks to take, um, which is why I think a lot of them are postponing how they tackle this uh, uh, as a, a strategic technology project. And we're working with a number of our customers to say that we know the deadline is quite a way away, but that a lot of planning from now will save you a lot of um, heartache much further on. Um, so uh, um, I think that the, the key takeaways, I would say that um, this is requiring a combination of um, re more sophisticated reporting and analysis um, using um, more uh, powerful computational capabilities. Um, are you finding, Thomas, that this is being this message is being taken on board? Um, I think, sort of, in our conversations with sort of various clients, the um, I think it's a very mixed story. So some clients are further advanced, typically the the tier one banks in sort of understanding what the implications are for them and uh, then it sort of goes down from tier two to tier three to sort of a fairly long tail who but then sort of the uh, understanding I would say dramatically drops off fairly quickly. Um, I think there's a, there's a, that, that, that's typically just a function that they don't have the uh, resources to, to look into all these regulatory demands. Uh, I think Simon did a good job in kind of setting the scene what, what else is happening besides FRTB and obviously if you say 2019 um, that, that doesn't ring the alarm bells at the moment um, but I, I think sort of what you outline sort of from a technology point of view I think we can we can sort of also outline sort of on the organizational and on the management side because in a lot of these cases um, the organization is not necessarily set up to um, drive these numbers down to a desk level and sort of all these decisions which 
in the future will be taken by sort of this new called desk head and, and should be driven by this desk head and where you might have very sort of within a single bank diverging approaches uh, of what one desk does versus what another desk does um, sort of are not, not, less, not necessarily fully understood. I think um, if we're coming to that desk topic, a lot of people say, oh yeah, we already have Volker desk. Can we just use those because it would, would make it easy? Um, but I think the more they look into that, that, that doesn't really work for most, most of the organizations. One of the areas of feedback that we've been getting pretty regularly is particularly from banks away from the center. Um, this is all run through the BCBS, um, uh, driven under the auspices of BIS. Um, and from what we understand, that there are 28 central banks which are, make up the BCBS rules mm -hmm. um, um, environment. Um, central banks which fall outside that, um, do they have an option whether to implement these at local level? And um, how quickly are all those 28 central banks going to enforce those at local level on their members? So clearly the 28 central bank ju jurisdictions are going to expect their members to um, meet these deadlines. Yeah. There's an awful lot of other banks in the world who feel they're going to be exempt. Um, and I won't name the territories I've been at, um, and they have been given a lot more indications of leeway from their um, that's, local that's regulators. That's interesting here, isn't it, Peter? And plainly, in Europe, as I said, we'll expect uh, draft legislation out by the end of this year on implementing fundamental review of the trading book in Europe. Uh, that will take a year or so to go through the uh, regulatory process by the time you know, we talk with parliamentarians and, uh, and the council, and then you know, a year or so, no doubt, of transition through to implementation. All those banks that sit around the, uh, all the central banks and supervisors that sit around the Basel table are expected by the Basel committee to get on with implementing it. I think the European Union is getting on with it, implementing it uh, in reasonably, uh, well, as quickly as it can. Now we've near, we've got most of it. There's still some stuff uh, for finalisation. I think mm -hmm. still in many technical areas, but you know we're going to have uh, a European regime within in the deadline. Um, you know, given that many internationally active banks will operate in non-Basel committee environments, my feeling is that their uh, preference would be to have FRTB implemented in those regions uh, uh, as well. So I, I suspect there'll be, for the large internationally active banks, uh, an expectation that this is going to be uh, implemented widely. So not just in Europe, not just in North America, but in other, some of those other parts of mm. the world, perhaps that you're not going to name at this point, Peter, that uh, may think they can uh, hang back a bit. I don't think they'll be able to. Okay, I mean, um, one of the areas, and it's in the public domain because I have written about it, was, was for example, a discussion with risk managers in Israel, who are um, not one of the 28 central banks, and they felt they would not be immediately obliged to meet these deadlines which are set in, in the plans we just talked about. But um, uh, do you believe, therefore, that banks which are outside those 28 but may have branches in the jurisdictions in Europe or the United States are going to be then forced to comply that's by their peers on a counterparty that's, basis? That's my expectation because you know, if you're doing good risk management, you don't want to mm -hmm. understand that your counterpart is managing their trading book risk in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's sort of. That's probably uh, similar to what we were hearing. I think one, one issue we've been hearing was also that people were not comfortable to move forward with the current level of uh, the guidance from the, from the BCBS. Um, I think our, our impression and that's sort of what we have sort of been, okay. been getting also from, from discussions with the regulator was that there's probably not going to be sort of significantly more detail. There is going to be some sort of technical level under it, obviously, but um, Sort of the local implementations are not going to be uh, significantly sort of uh, different or significant variations of what the BCBS currently currently says, and that's sort of also one of the clear objectives of this entire process to go get to sort of a framework which is where, which leads to comparable numbers across jurisdictions. So uh, I don't think this entire argument of saying, well, we'll wait till I don't know CCR2 or sort of maybe the the local regulator has published. Uh, their view on FRTB is, is particularly valid. I think, uh, sort of, in a, given the the timeline, and again looking back to Basel 2.5, I think the initial timeline was two years, and then it got extended because people couldn't get it done. 
So now the regulator is given three years to get it done. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much appetite afterwards than to say, well, we're going to extend it again. So, I, so I, I we're think absolutely right, yeah. And I think that uh, CRR2 will impose ways of doing things. It also, through primary legislation, but it will also require, I expect, the European Banking Authority to write guidelines to put a little bit more flesh on the legislative primary legislative bones. Would, would you therefore say that any international bank, or a bank that aspires to have um, international capabilities and has a trading book with some market risk is going to have to use the FRTB approach to demonstrate that it's allocating the right levels of capital against those sort of because exposures? Because it's got to demonstrate that, that not just to its own regulator, which may or may not be FRTB mm -hmm. compliance on day one, but it's also got to demonstrate that to its counterparties as well. Right. Okay, on, on that basis, uh, we mentioned at the beginning that we're going to ask you a couple of questions, and uh, we may have alluded to that in our early discussions, but um, we're asking you now to see if you, how much you know. Um, the FRT, FRTB deadline is coming up when? Would you like to hazard a guess and just uh, tick the appropriate circle and press OK, and uh, we'll, we'll see how many of you are on the ball, and then we'll give you some thoughts on the answer to that. Uh, no Googling. No Googling, no Googling. Okay. Are we getting some instant answers? Have we... Are we able to show those? Yeah. Okay, so um, out of those that have answered, we're saying that 62.5% um, say January 2019 and 37.5% um, say December 2019. Um, in a way, you both sometime in 2019. Sometime in 2019, and, and you both might be correct, um, Thomas. We were discussing this the yeah. other day, and maybe you could explain why both of those um, ends of the equation could be. Yeah, accurate. I think I think I think people who, who sort of voted for both of these, they're spot on. These are the two dates which are mentioned in the um, in the BCBS paper. Um, um, I think. I think the, the wording in there says basically um, you need to report for December 2019 and then leaves it open to the, to the local uh, authorities to decide when uh, from January uh, to the end of 2019 um, they want to sort of start with uh, the relevant processes but obviously if you, if you kind of look at it, well I have to push it at the latest. Uh, create a report uh, for 31st of December, that means I have to do a lot of things before that and I need to have my systems up and running a long time before that and I need to have started to collect data a long time before that and uh, sort of having having looked at the same issue in Basel 2.5, I think sort of realistically you, you need to be sort of fairly fairly complete at the end of 2018 and then then uh, sort of see where your local uh, regulator decides what data you have to submit at what, what, what point. But there's obviously no way you can start in December 2019 to try to retrofit uh, some of this, this data or start collecting it. Yeah, but that's one thing, the feedback that we've been getting <coughs> is that January 1, 2020, they all must be compliant and be able to demonstrate compliance with this and that they have to be able to run in parallel for 12 months. Is that 12 months cast in stone or is that the sort of time they need to demonstrate to regulators that they are coping with these uh, requirements? Or is there a minimum time that you see that uh, a three month or six month um, period which would uh, be sufficient to show that they were ready on the 1st of January? Um, I, I think from my perspective that's probably, so if we're talking about the parallel run, typically that's not not too much interest from the banks to uh, extend parallel run mm. uh, for for too long because it's obviously a fairly cost intensive and, and cumbersome way uh, of, of doing your daily processes and you might have to sort of hire additional people or get additional people to, to just support that uh, operationally. Um, so I don't think I don't know, more than 12 months is, is, is on, the, on the window but uh, I'm, I'm just thinking it sort of more from a practical perspective if you if you think you need to be compliant sometime in 2019. That means you have to put an application in for your models sometime in 2018. That means you have to be confident that mm -hmm. these models work. And I'm not sure how you sort of gain confidence if you don't have a sort of system up and running uh, where you have at least the capability to sort of run a normal daily process because back testing requirements, uh, sort of PL attribution requirements, there's 
there's a lot in there, especially if you look at the IMA approach, um, where you just can't sort of upfront specify everything, but you, where you actually need to sort of find out how does this work in the data and how does how does the model perform, and sort of you need to do a bit of fine tuning and sort of what we advise people is basically plan for 2018 to try to do this fine tuning, even if you I don't know need to resize desks or if you need to um, sort of tweak models. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a number of things you need to consider. And I think you raised an important point <coughs> there, Thomas, and that it's not just the banks that have to be ready for this; it's the supervisors that have to be ready to receive start receiving model approvals and making mm -hmm. judgments of them. And that's quite a tall order. Is that something where you have concerns mm -hmm. about um, that the supervisors aren't? staffed up or sufficiently educated or do they not have the technology capability to manage all well, this? I think that the uh, the answer to that is they'll be getting a whole slew of uh, applications mm -hmm. for modeling around the same time. So mm -hmm. they, that's, that's one of my jobs as your trade association to remind regulators around the world that they've created these regulations mm -hmm. and we need their help in implementing them. Yeah, I think just just again from I don't know, some discussions with regulators we had, is, uh, I don't think there is at the moment I don't know, the personnel to just review all the, all the applications which would go in because uh, previously I think banks submitted a bank-wide application and now they're submitting a bank-wide application and they submit material for the desks and um, I'm not sure what the, what the approach will be if people get, get an approval based on the fact that they used to have one and it will be sort of then reviewed in detail later on. That could be one approach but um, I think I think it's not sort of these kind of operational details are not, not particularly hammered out. Right, okay. I wonder if we could maybe dig a little bit deeper mm -hmm. and look at your thoughts of the differences between the standard approach and the IMA and what a bank might weigh up in order to consider continuing with an IMA approach and what benefits that would add to their um, uh, quality of their analysis. Um, the uh, more accurate pricing of uh, capital allocation? Um, uh, are they going to be in a more advantageous position? Or is it going to be something that's just too complicated and cumbersome that's really not worth the benefits? Are we going to see a drop in IMA and people focus on a standard approach? And how, how do you see the, the fine differences between the two that uh, they, they, they need to consider? Yeah, I think this is, this is one of their probably, I don't know, this is probably the $100 million question. In the in, in the equation, because um, sort of you could almost describe the standardized approach as some, some sort of IMA approach light, mm -hmm. or uh, a simplified IMA approach. Um, so I think for uh, you will have to do it. Nevertheless, uh, it's already clear there will be some sort of flooring, or the numbers of your standardized approach will be compared to your IMA approach. So um, how far you can actually divert is not necessarily clear um, and that obviously determines how much capital benefit your IMA model would actually produce. Um, the requirements on the IMA side are I think complex and uh, probably also moved with a little sort of they are, they are sort of more structured than they used to be so you can't really sort of build a model probably which which sort of aligns to what you're doing from a risk management or from a business perspective because you actually have to implement a specific type of of model, or you have to sort of build within certain certain parameters the the regulator outlines. Um, so I think if if you are on standardized approach right now, I don't think there's a lot of banks who consider moving to the IMA approach, mm -hmm. while there's so much sort of uncertainty and it's not really clear whether it brings any advantages. And if you are on IMA approach right now, um, well, you have a lot of banks which actually down or, or sort of cut down on their capital markets activities, plainly speaking, and for them uh, it will be, as you, as you outlined sort of in, your, in your opening statement, it will be significantly uh, expensive and, and time consuming and uh, uh, management attention to, to kind of build this model and, and come up with all this infrastructure and uh, all the processes and build the associated management structures around that. So uh, I'm not sure whether banks have actually the option to say, well, we did IMA previously, but we don't, we don't want to do that in the future. I don't think that's sort of a message which would, obviously for the individual bank, it might be the rational decision and that mm. might be fine, but I don't think the, 
the, the intention of this process is to, to ultimately lead to, uh, to a situation where then most banks say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll just get rid of IMA mm -hmm. altogether and sort of our risk management gets less sophisticated. I don't think that's what at least the regulator in Europe doesn't want to see. Uh, I think maybe on the US side, um, they're quite comfortable with, with fairly uh, yeah, formulaic or sort of simple models similar to the leverage ratio. So they might not be too unhappy about it, actually. What a loose uh, definition. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, you're right, Thomas, in terms of the expectations on this side of the water being very much that you know, banks should be continuing to move forward with their risk management systems, mm -hmm. improve risk governance. I, I, I think that uh, you, know, you might have a bit of explaining to do if you wanted to uh, flip out of a, a modeling approach to a more standardized approach. In, in your early remarks, opening remarks, Thomas, you pinpointed this definition of the trading desk, which is at the heart of the, these new regulations. Um, we're hearing stories that in preparation for FRTB, uh, a lot of the big investment banks and those that have meaningful trading desks, trading rooms, are running these kind of calculations now to see if it's going to be worth being in these spaces in time to come. We know the tough time banks are having um, with uh, returns on equity being uh, often below their cost of capital so that they can't continue in that vein forever. We also know a lot of banks, uh, because of other regulatory um, positions, are exiting things like fixed income because they can't uh, carry the cost of being market makers. Do you see this as being a big shake-up in the banking industry, investment banking industry, that we could see big banks exit large areas of cap the capital markets as a result once they analyze how much capital is going to be allocated against future trades? Um, yeah, I think, I think the capital question, uh, that's, that's also one of these uh, questions everybody tries to answer up front. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily sort of that one straightforward answer because sort of you can't just sort of individually look at capital, you also have to look at sort of margins or at profits. And mm -hmm. so, so there might also be a, an element of repricing because if everybody exits a particular market, then if you're the last person there, then uh, you, can, you, can pr you probably have a better time in setting prices. Um, <laughs> but so, so that, that's not particularly clear. I think the, the, the transformation is more sort of on the, on the management side, how banks sort of manage their capital markets business. And I think Previously, you had a situation where market risk was kind of a top of the house number, mm -hmm. and uh, there might have been some sort of allocation. Nobody really was too sure about uh, how that sort of corresponded to desks. But sort of in the future, you can obviously pinpoint which desk is doing what, and sort of what's the profitability of a particular desk, and that probably that desk head is getting a lot more challenge from his sort of senior management. Um, why do we need to be in that business if you're actually, I don't know, consuming that much capital and not bringing in that many, that much profit? Or equally, uh, sort of that desk head needs to answer to the regulator, well, your, your IMA model might work, but on your particular desk it doesn't. So we'll actually kick you out of your, your IMA and you go back to standardized, um, which might attract a big sort of jump in their capital charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think sort of these kind of processes have not been really worked through because you could just think about when you define your desk you can take a very sort of let's say a very uh, aggressive approach and say oh yeah, we'll try to get everything into IMA as much as we can and risk that we have a number of desks which then sort of uh, fall out from now and then and we'll try to get them back in or you say well we actually just put into IMA what what we can vary under sort of very sort of uh, conservative assumptions model, and we'll keep sort of the the majority of it on standardised approach. I think there is a bigger question here, isn't there, about whether, and I don't think this this uh, this fallout will happen overnight. But it will be a gradual process. But does that gradual process end up in a position where end users have less choice of who mm -hmm. to go to? And as, as Thomas says, does that give those final uh, suppliers uh, the, the the greater market uh, yeah. power? Yeah, and uh, I think there's also, sort of, um, if we think about the, uh, so there's obviously an agenda which is post financial crisis to make banks safer, but equally I think there's now an agenda from the ECB to say, oh yeah, we want a capital markets union and we want, for example, uh, I think uh, transparent, simple, transparent and um, 
standardized, <laughs> standardized <laughs> secularization. Um, so if you look into the FRDB rule, secularization is actually um, not particularly uh, sort of advantageous mm -hmm. under the under the new rules, but they have put in a footnote that they might review this based on what the ECB might be doing on that particular topic. And it's interesting to note, just picking up on that, that the Basel Committee's annual report for 2015, which came out uh, last week, was also talking about there being a number of speeches over the past week, you know, the need to balance prudential supervision with the ability of banks to do what they do for society, which is take deposits and lend money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, historically, the investment banks have been reasonably early adopters of uh, different types of technology and in things like um, the, the speed of trading um, to do with latency issues and to do with greater analytics and the use of algorithms and so forth. Um, do you feel that they've got those capabilities on board or are they going to have to prepare for a whole new set of capabilities as some people are um, echoing back to us? Uh, is, is there a repurposing of technology or are they going to be taking in new technologies which they might be able to use for other purposes and just regulatory delivery? How do you see that picture? Um, I think from our discussions it's again, it's a very strategic question. You should probably decide at the very outset of your FRTB program or at the very outset of your sort of capital markets transformation program. Um, there's, there, and it greatly depends on your on your sort of starting position. I, I think there are banks where, for example, the front of systems and the and sort of the, the risk systems are sort of let's say fairly siloed and mm. not not particularly linked up. And um, in these banks, you get a lot of questions on I don't know PNL attribution. How are we going to do this if if actually our risk model and, and the model which sort of creates our PNL are, di are different ones? And mm. that's going to be really hard, right? So for them. Um, they might consider moving to, or they are considering moving to a single platform. But again, it, it very much depends on where you are. We've talked to a tier two bank, which has a sort of a, a smaller, yeah, a smaller trading organization, and they have kind of worked through these, uh, yeah, um, issues in the past already. So they are, have already an integrated trading platform which kind of allows the front office and risk management to actually see the same numbers and use the same models in a very sort of uh, yeah, utility kind of fashion. It still allows the front office to I don't know, put their magic dust on, on, on the model and uh, do some interesting things, but um, sort of in principle they obviously sort of if you kind of address that issue from the bottom up, you can kind of resolve a lot of problems before they even occur. If you try to, at the very end, bring all these various, I don't know, legacy point systems and issues together, then uh, it's obviously uh, highly complicated and not highly, uh, probably not very cost effective uh, way of operating. And there's a question whether you can actually continue with that. Do you, do you therefore see a bank's ability to successfully implement the capability to deliver FRTB um, dependent on maybe a different business model, different working practices within the hierarchy of the organization, how they've shared information before, how they use information? You know, we heard in the aftermath of 2008 a lot of senior executives saying in banks that they only knew half of what was going on there uh, because there was not enough information fed to those who had to make decisions. Is this going to be part of forcing them to have a better information management process and hence risk management process? Well, I think to a degree it certainly does. Um, I think um, it, it might take a little bit sort of the opposite approach and actually pushing a lot of responsibility down and that again introduces that concept of the desk. Um, I think what I advise and what we advise is um, basically start early with this, try, try some things out, maybe do it on a, on a desk level, sort of in almost, almost a prototype environment, mm -hmm. rather than sort of try to, what, what sort of risk systems have been in the past, sort of try to build this kind of bank-wide solution, which moves very, very slowly. And then, sort of in the middle of I don't know 2017 or at the end of 2017, you find out it's not doing what what you want wanted to do uh, because there is a lot of uncertainty and there is a lot of processes. It's not the calculations in FRTB are not that difficult. So I think there, there's no no bank which will struggle to implement that. It's, it's more sort of how do you make this work at scale and how mm -hmm. do you 
build processes to make this sort of work every day in a, in a way where you don't have a thousand people trying to send spreadsheets to each other and uh, try, to, try to sort of change that 1.3 to 1.4 because that one system doesn't connect to the other one. Well, maybe you could just elaborate on that a bit because there's this shift now under these new rules from sort of VAR to estimated losses and from what we understand, this is like extended to the tail risk, which then has to be involved in the calculations which are taking place, um, demonstrated over 10 years' worth of data for financial for the instruments that you're proposing to um, uh, trade in. Now, we have worked out that to do the FRTB calculations on an IMA model for that kind of uh, process, it's like 30 million um, calculations which would take you a week or two to do under the current circumstances. Now, you obviously need the capability to bring that down to a few minutes, which the resources are there to do in today's technology age, but um, how do you see that, that actually working? And maybe you could just elaborate a bit on that shift from the yeah. VAR to the estimated <coughs> loss and what it yeah. means to the banks in terms of um, what they're going to have to consider. Yeah, so I think one, one of the things you, you mentioned um, FRTB moves to expected shortfall or estimated loss, so it basically takes takes the average of the tail rather than a particular point on the distribution. What that means is you actually have to clean your entire data set, not just the few points around the tail um, or sort of uh, around where you expect the bar to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it that, that, that's, probably, that's probably actually a, an operational thing which you can fix fairly quickly. The thing. There are computational challenges, and I'm sure, uh, sure you're, you're a lot better qualified than I to talk about them. <laughs> um, but I think, I think what, what we are seeing, and, and what's also entirely underestimated, is, is just the operational challenges and, and, and sort of the management tran transformation you actually have to do to kind of empower these people who uh, I don't know are the new desk heads who will have to answer to the regulator to decide. Um, <coughs> what they're going to do and, and sort of to actually steer or run their desk as a, as a business because that's, that's basically the expectation the regulator has on this, on yeah. this topic and um, that obviously ultimately feeds into the technology question. Um, I think all of that can be solved if you, you know, there's, there's a lot of smart people working in this industry. Absolutely. Um, so um, <laughs> I think technology has not necessarily been uh, a problem in, in or in capital markets because you can always mm -hmm. no, that that can be solved if you put enough brain power to it. Right. So, or right. if you put enough resources to it, the question is more: Do you actually want to solve it? And uh, sort of, can we solve it in an intelligent way, and not just I don't know, throw money at the problem? Okay. Uh, well, we can take that on a bit further after this. <coughs> I think we should go to our second audience question. Um, given what you've heard, and uh, can you give us some feedback? Where is your organisation on this FRTB? compliance journey. So we've given you five options there. I don't think anyone's going to be hitting the bottom button, but um, if you give us some feedback as to um, where you are in this process, um, we'd be quite interested to see the results. Okay, um, it looks like the, the um, bulk of the responses are in and uh, they're split pretty evenly um, around uh, we are only just starting to think about uh, FRTB and uh, we've created a committee that's looking at where we are today and what we need to do. So um, nobody has progressed to level C yet looking at solutions. So again, that would indicate our own feedback, as support our own feedback, that uh, uh, there's... Uh, it, it, most people at the very beginning of this journey. Um, maybe I'd just take what you were saying earlier, Thomas, a bit further, and that you know this is not the only regulatory um, imposition that banks are having to deal with. And a lot of banks' complaints are that you know they get hit with one after another. You know they keep building fixes for one set of regulations and then have to spend more on technology and analysis and everything to deliver a whole set of new requirements. No. Um, they would like to see more cohesiveness and consistency from regulators um, and be able to tackle all of these with one go. Um, that's obviously not going to happen. No. And there's also no coherence, we should we understand, between 
different regulatory <coughs> jurisdictions as well who interpret some of these things differently or ask them in for them different formats. Um, is there some way in which um, banks can tackle this in a more purposeful manner, more strategic manner, or they've just got to put up with ad hoc answers to all of these regulatory demands? Yeah, I think so. It's probably, I would sort of structure my, my answer to that question in, in, two, in two sort of segments. I think one, um, I'm not so sure that actually the regulation is that fundamentally different. I think there is, in the, in the nuts and bolts, there's obviously differences, but sort of if you look at it from a, from a sort of what is the purpose of this and what are we trying to achieve, mm -hmm. then there's fairly clear regulations which sort of uh, across the sort of uh, various jurisdictions align with each other. And what they're trying to achieve is typically fairly similar. They might try it in a slightly different way, but not, not sort of in a... Uh, I, I've hardly seen very sort of new or very, uh, very sort of uh, distinct approaches in... It does happen, but that, that, that's fine. I think where the, where the complexity is actually uh, come in, and that, that's sort of the other point you mentioned, is that banks are building fixes. Mm -hmm. And obviously, so if you build a fix on a fix on a fix, and at some point nobody really knows what's a fix and what's actually, what was the original problem, and are we now fixing a fix, or are we fixing the problem, or are we actually trying to sort of comply with what was originally asked for. So I think looking at what some of the banks are doing and sort of what we are seeing, there's, there's some sort of fundamental issues which have not been addressed for a very long time in, in sort of, uh, I guess, the, the boom years to up, leading up to the crisis, uh, where I think the main purpose was to increase revenue at, at almost uh, any, any, any cost. Um, and sort of these underlying issues are kind of now popping up again and again and again. And obviously every time they pop up, you have to build a fix for them. But I think that brings us back to that FRTB timeline, which we have now on the screen. Um, if you kind of start now, collect actually the right data you need to collect for FRTB, mm -hmm. then if it can actually be a quite effective process. Yes. The problem is just if you end up in 2000, end of 2017 or 2018, and then you say, oh, um, how are we going to do this now? Um, then you will look at your systems and you will find, oh, yeah, we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. Mm -hmm. So the reason why you don't have this is because you didn't collect it in 2016. It's not because it's not possible to collect. And then you're in a situation where you're sort of out of time to, to actually go back sort of upstream and collect the information you actually need. And then you'll start building a fix on how you could sort of approximate that particular data point with some other data points, but that sort of works only for 80% of your trades and then for 20% you come up with something else. Um, and that obviously perpetuates itself through the entire sort of, through the entire sort of step. So uh, I think what we're saying is, well, probably want to look at regulation on sort of a thematic mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. look, at, look at a particular topic, look at a particular theme of regulation rather than one particular one, and then try to address this in a more sort of strategic way rather than saying, oh yeah, we're, we just got this BCBS paper and now we have to sort of, uh, sort of chase the next, uh, the next deadline. I was, I was going to ask you, you, you mentioned it again, you used the word transformation earlier on. Is there um, a way in which banks could use the impetus from FRTB and maybe some of the other regulatory initiatives coming through to take a more strategic approach review of their technology systems? Because we know that large chunks of their discretionary technology spend is really soaked up on the regulatory area right now. And, and then use that for transforming the rest of the technology operations of the bank, which, as you say, have got lots of fixes here, there, and everywhere, and apps left, right, and center, um, and they're very complex. Probably could do with being a bit more simplified, and we talked about the data integration requirements from FRTB yeah. around risk and front, op front office. You know, is this time for a strategic overhaul of technology, and this could be the trigger for it? I think it sounds like a very nice idea, Peter, but I think there's so much that's going on. <laughs> and the different sort of silos of getting ready for yeah. uh, you know, the, the, what is the final uh, prudential regulatory architecture. But there's just, 
I suspect it, you're, you're going to be, have to be a pretty thoughtful bank to have the opportunity to sit back and hope, hover over and think what. So we're, still, we're still going to live with the silos, are we? What, what, what do you think, Thomas? <laughs> Well, I think uh, I think there, there's kind of uh, there's probably some middle ground here. I think sort of on the one hand, um, uh, I think this doesn't hit hit any bank where people are sitting around and sort of waiting for stuff to do. I think most banks are uh, all banks are very busy with a lot of initiatives and uh, a lot of lot of pressure in terms of cost base and uh, sort of keeping keeping everything up and running. And sort of on the other hand, uh, I think you can't just uh, uh, you have to kind of balance probably the, the element of keeping things running and um, uh, the element of uh, sort of being a bit more ambitious and actually sort of doing something more transformational mm. because there is this issue in the market and nobody has found a very good solution to it. I have to admit um, that you have this legacy infrastructure. And it keeps dragging and dragging and dragging. And everybody knows it's dragging. It's costing us money every year, but nobody has sort of at the moment enough. Um, I don't know. Probably they not the profitability is there. Not the, there's a whole host of reasons not to do it. Mm. But there's also a whole host of reasons why I don't know fintech companies taking away mm. uh, certain pockets of the market and sort of you know if you don't do it in the end. It's almost you will be you will be not there anymore. Right. So um, there are banks which are sort of very ambitious in putting in new platforms and and doing that. But obviously, as a bank, you need to be in a position where you can actually spend that kind of money. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's horses for courses. Well, maybe we just go down to our last agenda item we had. Then we go back to Simon on this one. And you know, will these new regulations have the desired effect of making the banking system safer? Um, you know, you've got a lot of members around there, and I've heard whinges as well that all they're doing is tying up more and more capital, and I'm now having to go out in the marketplace with one hand tied behind my back half the time. And I think I think uh, I think that's right. I think. Uh, People on boards that I speak to say they spend an inordinate amount of their time thinking about uh, regulation, compliance. The senior managers of the regime, of course, have been interest, introduced over the past year. That's excited a lot of attention. And they're not thinking about, well, what's the right bit of the trading book business for me to be in in five years' time? They're not taking, they don't have the time to think about what's the right technology solution. I think people are, are very much yeah. overcome. Yeah by regulation, and as we said earlier on, it's being done in silos, both by uh, the banks, but also by regulators, so we're missing out the opportunities, I think, yeah. to have a more integrated approach. And I guess that's, that's kind of where I would, would probably argue, well, you can actually say, you can see FRTB as another incoming regulation, but you can also see that as an opportunity to actually sort of realign your business and do something which is, which is entirely uh, new or entirely sort of sort of a step out in in terms of seeing which markets do you want to be in and which products do you want to trade. And I think that's uh, that's the trick, isn't it, for our member banks as they employ us consult uh, employ consultants like you to, to really find you know we're not just doing this because the regulators tell us to do so. It's actually about better risk management and it's about looking to find the synergies between the different uh, regulatory initiatives to, to do really do things better. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and we're also, from our perspective, working with a lot of these guys with more open architecture technologies, which will help them de-silo. I mean, they will. They need to take data out of those silos and aggregate it as well. So they need to be looking within the trading desks, within the asset classes. But we get the impression they need to have a horizontal view, better aggregated enterprise-wide view of risk as well, not just by, by asset yeah. class. And so, so I think that that is being considered and the new technologies are becoming available to do that at a lower price point, you know, so they can um, you know, take it on board. Um, I, guess, I guess we're um, nearing the end of our time, and um, I think there have been a couple of questions. Yeah. How do we want to deal with those? Well, please keep your questions coming in. Um, certainly, um, we, we feel that um, there's a lot more to talk about on, the, on this topic, um, but one question has come in. What impact might the recent Brexit events have on the possible timelines? Can you answer um, in five minutes left? <laughs> I, think, I think I think the short answer is probably we don't know. The other short answer is probably none. Um, I don't I don't think that that anybody has in in at least sort of the the remaining EU has any appetite to slow any of this down. Right. Um, 
I don't. I'm not even sure that the UK has any appetite to slow no, down because they have been leading on this. Yeah. The interesting question will be how does it, in you know, 2000 so when these rules are finalised in the parliamentary process, perhaps let's call it uh, you know, mid late 2017. How does the uh, the the Prudential Regulatory Committee, as it would be called then, rather than the PRA, yeah. how does it carry over those rules into, uh, UK, into, into the UK handbook? And that's very much up in the air, depending on the sort of deal that uh, the UK government strikes with uh, with Europe. Yeah, well, I think all of the, the main European banks are committed to meet these deadlines. They, they're, they're all part of the signatories to um, the, the BCBS. So, at the moment, I don't see any reason for it to be delayed. It's a, no, it's a global I, thing, and yeah. we've got a so. we've got a local issue here, which is um, okay, creating some uncertainty, should we say? But um, uh, I, I don't think it's going to affect a regulatory yeah. implementation program. Um, and nor should it. That shouldn't be the sort of excuse. No. Well, it, no. it will not. Uh, I don't think it will affect the timelines. Mm -hmm. if, if you go back to that BCBS uh, level, obviously, I don't know. The Bank of England is in there. The ECB is in there. So mm. um, whether there is now a UK law implementing this, or whether it's a EU directive and mm. leading into uh, sort of then local laws is is probably not particularly uh, relevant from from the content mm. perspective. Okay, well, and gentlemen, would want to sum up with any thoughts on you know the um, regulatory environment and um, and where we're going? Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot uh, going on, so I think the answer is that as soon as we've got. Um, a degree of certainty from the regulatory community, uh, we've got to get on with doing it. Let's not wait until CRR2 is finalised, completed the uh, parliamentary process. We've got a pretty broad idea of what it's going to look like, and I think it's, uh, it makes good sense to get on with it now. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I would also encourage um, every sort of market participant to basically uh, start looking into it or uh, basically getting on with it um, this year and try to make some good progress, uh, maybe do a prototype, maybe sort of look at a particular desk, uh, maybe combine it with uh, sort of business you want to want to step out. I think also if you look at the employees in banks, you know, they are using their iPhones, they are using, mm. you know, technology with the, which is available on the internet and I think uh, there's sort of when you talk to these people, they're not they're not particularly happy with some of the systems they have to use, and <laughs> nobody nobody likes sending around spreadsheets and things like that. So I think there are more effective ways of working, and I think this is a good chance to to look at that. Great. Okay. Well, we're we're also seeing that a lot more automation and analytics getting away from the yeah. spreadsheets, and uh, that goes into a whole new discussion apart from the regulatory one today. But maybe we can revisit <laughs> that sometime. But uh, all very exciting. Okay, um, gentlemen. No, th thank you very much indeed. I'm um, Peter and Thomas and also Simon. Um, we'd, we're very grateful to my sister um, supporting us on this um, on this um, webinar. And yeah, we look forward to receiving more questions afterwards. Uh, and Peter and Thomas have agreed to um, stand by, as it were, to receive any other emails or questions that you may have. You want to put to them afterwards. And your contact details are available at the uh, on, the uh, on the slide deck okay. as well on the last slide. And so you'll see their contact details where you can reach them um, directly um, on that. Um, for those people who couldn't attend this, this um, webinar, there is an availability to download this and receive it on demand, and that will be sent um, direct to your inbox um, after this um, presentation alongside the slide deck um, in PDF format. Indeed. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Have a great day.